Welcome to our newest installment of our Tips and Tricks series. In this series, we will cover a subject that has generated a lot of interest in the continuous improvement or CI community, Kata. There will be three episodes in this series. The first episode will provide some general tips and tricks for the overall approach. Episode two will provide suggestions for the practice of the improvement kata, while episode three will provide tips and tricks for the coaching kata. As with all our tips and tricks series, we assume that the viewer will have previous knowledge of the topic, and ideally some experience in its practice. If you are completely new to the subject, we suggest starting off by reading the initial book on the topic by Mike Rother titled Toyota Kata. Mr. Rother now has three books on the subject. Let's get started. First, a little background. Mike Rother published Toyota Kata in 2009. During his many years of research of Toyota, he observed how Toyota develops the process improvement skills and mindsets in its team members over time. The real secret sauce of Toyota is not so much its vaunted production system, but how it develops its team members to continuously improve that system, or at least they're part of it. Visitors to Toyota over the years would focus on the tools of the Toyota Production System, or TPS, but miss the culture, a culture of CI, that is the foundation of their system. The underlying principles of proper CI practice, really scientific thinking, are embedded in how Toyota approaches improvement, or Kaizen, as they call it. Kata fills an important gap in the practice of process improvement, which came about as Lean became more and more popular with organizations in different industries. Starting in the late 1990s and throughout the 2000s, organizations became focused on the tools of Lean, pull Kanban, Flow, 5S, standardized work, and the like. Further, many believe that improvement could only happen through facilitator-led multi-day events and month-long projects. This was perpetuated by the various delivery models that consultants were following and selling for that matter, myself included. Throughout the 1990s, I taught and practiced the concepts and methodologies that at the time were referred to as total quality management. I used a seven-step process based on Deming's Plan, Do, Check, Act, or PDCA. With the companies I worked with, almost all within driving distance at that time, I would work with them regularly, usually weekly, and over longer periods of time. This gave me the opportunity to work closely with members of those organizations. My learners, typically group leaders, supervisors, and middle management, would apply the seven-step process in a very deliberate way to processes for which they were responsible. Process changes would be made relatively quickly, typically weekly, but sometimes more frequently in between my visits. I used Deming storyboards to help the learners and myself as their coach. The effects were impressive, not just the results achieved, but in the development of process improvement and problem-solving skills within the people I worked with. The book Lean Thinking was published in 1997. And by 2000, my conversations with organizations began to change. I continued to propose the approach I just described, teaching frontline leaders proper process improvement and problem-solving techniques while they worked on real-world processes, and in time, they would develop the same skills within their team members. However, senior leaders and organizations began to push back. What about pull combine? I like to apply cellular flow. How about 5S and the like? Leaders became enamored by the tools that they read about, heard about, or perhaps saw in practice in visits to other organizations. Further, my work began to lead me to work with organizations that required air travel. I easily fell into the pitfall of multi-day events. After all, companies weren't very willing to pay the substantial travel expenses for me to visit for just one day and multiple visits at that. As a believer of there are multiple possible routes to your destination, I went along with it. I would assist an organization with their lean transformations, making the requisite approximate week-long or near-week-long visits to implement cells, pull systems, apply 5S, and so on. After the first year or so, the companies were all very pleased with what was accomplished. They would ask, what's next? I would say phase two involves developing the process improvement and problem-solving abilities of your frontline and middle managers as they improve their processes and in time engage their team members. A common response was the suggestion of some other lean tool. I often chuckled and would remind the senior leader that ultimately all roads must lead to what I was prescribing. The publication of Toyota Kata made a strong case for the need for a different, albeit complementary, approach. 
Mr. Rother had developed a, has developed a vibrant community in the years that followed. Concurrently, organizations in all industries have come to realize that the real goal of Lean is to develop a culture of continuous improvement. Themes at conferences throughout most of the 2010s reflect this shift in thinking. And Mr. Rother, with his two kata or routines, provides a means to accomplish this elusive goal, patterned after what Toyota has practiced for decades. More broadly, he is hoping that these skills and mindsets are developed in school children to better prepare them for an ever-changing world. A noble cause indeed. Two keys are deliberate practice and repetition. It must be deliberate practice. It has been known for nearly 100 years that the human brain seeks patterns. Only through deliberate practice, carefully following a defined process, will the learning be effective and efficient. Haphazard practice of any skill will seriously hinder learning. The importance of repetitive practice to skill development has also been known for about 100 years. In fact, Edward Thorndike, the father of educational psychology, called the law of practice one of several important elements that must be in place for learning and skill development to occur. He said this in 1913. As commonsensical as all this may sound, it is not easy to pr properly practice. There are common pitfalls that should be avoided or addressed if they arise. The various tips and tricks that are provided in this series represent the most common pitfalls. The first tip is to understand that it is not about simply getting things done and making process improvements. Too many organizations with whom I come across still do not get this point. Presentations at conferences on their kata practice focus on results and little on the development of their people. Attendees at the University of Michigan's Kata for Daily Improvement Program, who profess to be practicing kata, also exhibit this misunderstanding. I often ask people who are practicing kata in their organizations about what they have observed in terms of people's willingness to set goals or targets, or their abilities to deal with uncertainty, or the development of objectivity in themselves and their learners. These questions are often met with looks of confusion. They talk about the number of people trained, the number of storyboards initiated or quote-unquote completed, the results achieved, and the like. We have had people in the University of Michigan class get overtly upset when they realize the missed opportunities of previous improvement efforts to develop the skills and mindsets and mindsets of those involved. The next tip is to not throw out your other improvement methodologies. As can happen with anything new, there is a lot of enthusiasm for it. I have come across individuals and organizations who made comments to the effect that what they had been doing with regard to Lean and CI was wrong. This would be incorrect. As I previously mentioned, those other methodologies of improvement, such as value stream mapping, multi-day Kaizen events, and A3 tour storyboards, are terrific complements to the Kata and vice versa. The fact is, organizations require several improvement methodologies at their disposal. The one that is used will depend on the scope and scale of an effort, as well as the other social benefits that are hoped to be gained by their application. For example, value stream mapping is a proven methodology to realize significant, even radical improvement, and to improve collaboration between functions and departments. And all represent opportunities to deliberately practice PDCA, and therefore are excellent learning techniques. It is important that proper process improvement be practiced. We th see this quite often in the University of Michigan workshop. People, even with years of experience in CI, are not exhibiting proper practice. Most commonly, they want to jump to solutions. This occurs because of this predisposition to applying tools in the form of check the box approach. We use a simple simulation during the simulation, nothing complicated. A simple assembly goes through four steps before it becomes a finished product ready to ship to meet customer orders. There is a strong element of quality in the simulation. The approach that should be taken to improve the various process steps really depends on the current situation. For example, if an assembly step or steps are experiencing quality issues, the product is incorrectly assembled, then that needs to be addressed first and foremost. However, quite commonly, experienced lean practitioners will want to immediately set up a one-piece assembly cell 
because after all, that's what we do in Lean. As instructors, we will look at the current conditions and ask the participants, what is the data telling you? Usually this works and they focus on improving quality. However, at times, certain individuals will insist on a change to one piece flow. The result, they will make more crap faster. I'll use this as a teaching point of an example of improper practice. Unfortunately, it often results in those individuals becoming dispirited and at times nasty. Yes, nasty. Still other times, they, the individuals can, will confide to me in private that they have learned that they have indeed been practicing a check-the-box approach to applying lean principles, often for years. This is great learning, though they don't typically want to admit it to the larger group. The point here is that it is often the CI practitioners who serve as coaches of others in their organizations. If they are playing the game incorrectly, then they are passing on bad habits. Habits are difficult enough to develop. Overriding existing bad habits makes it all the more challenging. To this last point, we have encountered numerous organizations where the responsibility for coaching lies within the CI professionals. The Kaizen Promotion Office or KPO, the Black Belts, the Lean Office, whatever you call them in your organization. This is a big mistake. The CI professionals, assuming they already follow proper practice, can serve as coaches, but not indefinitely. They can serve as role models, as the true coaches, the frontline supervisor or manager, develop sufficient skills to fulfill the coaching role. The CI professional then steps back into what we call a second coaching role. This is important so that the responsibility for CI remains where it belongs with frontline supervisors and managers, and ultimately everyone, or nearly everyone. Frankly, there is just not enough bandwidth of continuous improvement folks in an organization to fulfill this important role. Also, there is another reason for this. Coaches will develop a strong bond with their leaders over time. A solid foundation of trust will form. These are important and necessary characteristics to develop a culture of CI in any organization. If the CI professionals and only the CI professionals serve as coaches, this important benefit will be missed. I just men mentioned the term second coach. The second coach serves as an, an important role. They watch the interaction between coach and learner. A second coach would closely observe a manager working with their supervisors or a supervisor working with particular team members. Coaching is an active activity. It is difficult even for more seasoned coaches to see and hear all that is going on during the interaction. This is where the second coach comes in. They can provide timely feedback to the coach. Perhaps the coach didn't effectively listen to the learner. Perhaps there are physical indications from the learner that the coach overlooked. Maybe the coach unwittingly took ownership of the improvement process from the learner. These are just some of the things that can be overlooked. The second coaching model is a proven effective approach to learning and teaching anything, not just CI. In fact, it is how I was taught many years ago how to, to do performance evaluations, interviewing, how to conduct meetings, team huddles, and many other activities I was expected to perform as a manager. After demonstrating proper practice several times, my coach would move into a second coaching role and I would become the coach. The availability of people to serve as second coaches or the awareness of the need to have second coaches is a big gap in the practice of kata and beyond. The need for second coaches leads us to our next tip and trick. It is strongly recommended to take a narrow and deep approach in the practice of kata. Too many organizations try the peanut butter approach, spread it around thinly. This does not work well since in the beginning there is insufficient coaches and second coaches available. Work with a small group of frontline supervisors and managers. Once they have demonstrated a deep understanding of both routines or kata, then move on to another group. Importantly, the first group can serve as coaches and second coaches for subsequent groups. This approach will build momentum on itself. It is also better, it will also better ensure that those involved have a positive experience. This is really nothing new. This is the approach that should be taken with any change effort. For example, begin 5S in a particular area of the facility. Don't try to 5S the entire facility all at once. 
This will allow people to more deeply learn the concept before they move on to other areas better ensuring success. That brings episode one to a close. To recap, the key points from this episode are, one, remember it is about developing people, not just getting things done, or checking the box of things to implement. Two, the coach must recognize proper improvement kata practice. Three, don't delegate responsibility for the coaching kata. Continuous improvement professionals can serve temporarily as coaches, but that responsibility must be transferred as quickly as possible to those that are tr truly responsible for the continuous improvement of their processes, the frontline and middle managers. Four, the role of second coaches is important. And to that point, five, narrow and deep approach to deployment is recommended. In the next episode, we will provide additional tips and tricks specific to the practice of the improvement kata. Don't think that you already know how to improve. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, I, am, I have encountered numerous CI professionals whose practice was, let's just say, lacking. Everyone, including myself, can always improve our practice. In the third and final episode, we'll provide tips and tricks for the coaching kata. I hope that you will join us. Goodbye.